This is Heart Rhythm TV and I'm Daniel Aliesh here at the HRS Scientific Session 2025 here in San Diego. And I'm joined today by Dr. DJ Lacaretti. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Aliesh, how are you? Thank you for joining me. So, uh, we're here today to discuss your study, which you presented here and was simultaneously published in Jackie P. Um, this is the Nemesis PFA study. Um, and just to summarize for the viewers, around 870 patients, you enrolled prospectively in a multi-center registry, um, about 770 undergoing PFA by all the kind of major commercial modalities, comparator of a 98 RF, 98 patients undergoing RF for AFib. Um, a lot of very interesting um, findings from your study. You studied the kind of the collateral damage question. So, you know, first question for you, DJ, can you summarize overall your findings? Yeah, so the, this study basically comes from these initial observations of um, increased troponin elevations, um, hemolytic uh, anemia in a sense that you have hemolysis resulting in uh, drop in hemoglobin levels, which in turn could potentially impact renal function. And then earlier uh, case reports of increased um, uh, heart failure admissions because of the atrial stiffness and then subsequent need for diuresis and all of that, right? So uh, the participating institutions have a prospective registries that are already ongoing. So once we noticed this, we went ahead and added these uh, biomarkers to our evaluations and also systematically started doing strain imaging of the cardiac chambers before and after to see how this impacts cardiac function. So our hypothesis was do these, uh, does the pulse field ablation increase the risk of um, unwanted myocardial injury? And if so, how do we really measure it? And, uh, and how do we quantify it, right? And that's essentially what we did here. You know, I, I was impressed on a number of levels. Um, so, you know, significant troponin, high sensitive troponin elevations associated with the PFA relative to RF. Um, we also saw markers of hemolysis related to LDH haptoglobin going down significantly. And, um, and then the, also your atrial strain imaging done on the day of the procedure showed a significant drop in ejection fraction of the left atrium. So, I mean, you know, my read of your results was there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Um, there's such thing as, there's, you know, there are new things that we have to think about when we do PFA ablation. Um, you know, I'll ask you to comment some other things I found in your data. So, a lot of extra pulmonary triggers being done. Uh, posterior wall in 80%, CTI 24%. You were doing a, a, you know, a segment of uh, you know, single digits for the mitral isthmus as well as the SVC was about 18%, okay? And pulse, um, pulses applied were on the higher level. So, I'll ask you to comment, you know, given this is the real world, you know, this is, you know, this yeah. is. This is what you see in the real world because most of the clinical trials oftentimes restrict your lesion set, but then once it's a post-market release and, and the operators have the ability to use the catheter the way they, they want to use it for the particular atrium or the substrate that they're dealing with. Um, a lot of times, I think in the past, if you talk to operators, they were, many of them restricted the, their uh, tackling the posterior wall because of the potential for the atrioesophageal injury. Now that PFA really helped us to cross that Rubicon in terms of the uh, potential for LA, uh, la, uh, es esophageal injury or phrenic nerve damage or pulmonary vein stenosis, the ability to tackle posterior wall or the right anteroseptal areas uh, has significantly improved, right? So as a result of which you would see a lot more operators want to include these areas uh, in their lesion set. And you also have to realize most of these are tertiary referral centers that get redo-redo ablation cases um, and, and a relatively more progressed disease. Um, and that's the reason why I think you would see a significantly higher amount of uh, uh, applications and ablation uh, in these particular cases. Um, what, is also, what is also interesting in these cases is um, the amount of troponin elevation is a lot more than you see even in an acute myocardial infarction involving an yes. LED or a left main, yes. right? So 
the, the reason for that is you're looking at these large profile catheters, single shot catheters, that create an enormous amount of electromagnetic field when you turn them on, right? So this large electromagnetic field has to, will do its damage, not only the area that it is in contact with, but also the, the collateral impact on the uh, cardiac tissue that is around it, right? Mm -hmm. So as a result of which you have both um, reversible electroporative effect, you also have the irreversible electroporative effect depending on the impact of that energy on that particular piece of tissue, both in the atrium, and I also suspect there could be some effect on the neighboring ventricular myocardium also, because otherwise there is not enough critical mass of atrial tissue yeah. for, to, for yeah. anybody to see this kind of myocardial yeah. elevation, right? There also may be some improved myocardial transmurality also, right? That means you're taking out more, more deeper penetrative energy in this. So there is no question that there is evidence of acute injury as it is evidenced by elevation in high sensitive troponin levels. And there is also increased hemolysis because as the blood, red blood cells pass through the splines or around uh, th through, the, through the catheter, um, there could be a higher amount of hemolytic effects on that. And so as a result of which you have a greater drop in hemo hemoglobin. That in turn actually caused some cases of acute renal failure. Um, there were also some cases of um, myocardial ischemia or ST, STT changes from coronary vasospasm uh, very early on during ablation of the mitral isthmus as well as uh, cavotracuspidismus. That has mostly been disappeared now after we started using prophylactic um, nitroglycerin. And in some cases, some operators have actually stopped using uh, PFA, especially in proximity to these coronaries. Yes. Um, yeah, I saw about 2-3% vasospasm. Obviously, there was a 0% in the RF group. Um, so, you know, I want to, and I want to emphasize, you know, these are ICE operators, right? You're, everyone's using ICE, they're verifying electrocontact, they're driving the lesions into the tissue, you know, having effective lesions clearly. Um, now, sec secondarily, even despite those best efforts, you do see a fair amount of hemolysis related um, changes uh, on biomarkers as well as end organ issues. Um, and, and you also noticed different levels based upon the different PFA offerings, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, you want, would you share some of those findings? Yeah. So uh, the, hemo the hemolytic issue, I think, is an interesting one, right? So when you have an open construct catheter with splines and the blood passing through the splines while the energy goes through, you have a much higher risk of uh, hemolysis. Mm -hmm. As against if there is no open spline and, and it is everything is completely in contact with, then I think the amount of hemolysis could be slightly lower, right? Because mm -hmm. that just physiologically makes sense. More more white blood, red blood cells going through. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with with regards to, uh, what was the other question that you asked me? Well, I was saying, you know, there was there was also a different differential effect. Correct, on the number on of applications, yeah. right? So what, what, what was interesting is there was a linear progression in the worsening of the troponin leak or the degree of hemolysis as the number of applications went up, yeah. right? So when you really divided them into tertials, uh, the higher tertials basically had a higher amount of troponin leak, a greater amount of hemolysis, and also elevation in creatinine levels too. Yeah. So I think uh, people have to be aware of the fact that the more you ablate and there are more applications, I think there is a greater risk of um, causing a greater amount of myocardial injury. So maybe there is a sweet spot that one should stop at and, uh, and figure out um, maybe this is somebody that needs to come back for a, for, for a touch-up ablation or a second ablation. I, I think in the RF and point by point, there was a certain amount of technical challenge by, by adding lesion sets. I think that's changed a okay. lot and it becomes very easy to push the button. But I think what we're going to realize is the consequences of doing so are less easy to deal with. And so we're going to, we're going to have to say, as I said at the beginning, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's very right? true. Yeah, especially when you're applying PFA into the blood pool as opposed to into the tissue. However, you know, to, a final question or you know, final question for you. You talked about left atrial ejection fraction, a stunning phenomenon, okay? This is done the day of the procedure. You do it with strain imaging, projecting forward. Okay, the potential impact of that three months, mm -hmm. six months down the line. Um, where is our current understanding of that or where are we going with that? 
I, I think it's a great question and we really don't know largely what happens to this, right? So, if troponin leak indicates myocardial injury, whether it is reversible electroporation or non-reversible electroporation or, or necrosis of the tissue, um, the thermal injury, yet there is evidence of that. And if so, how exactly does the tissue heal? Um, the reparative process in electroporative injury is much different than it is with electrocoagulative injury, right? So, as a result of which, you may see that the MRI acutely, uh, as it is seen in a few small studies that were done, the delayed hyperenhancement that shows tissue edema may, may resolve at the end of three to four weeks, but in the long term, the microscopic fibrosis that can set in place could definitely have a longer term impact on the atrial health, contractility, the whole remodeling process could be significantly different. So we are very much eager to further analyze our, 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 our echo studies and figure out what else is going on. And I think longer term follow-up studies, either using strain analysis, strain imaging, or even higher sensitive magnetic resonance imaging uh, would be very pertinent in these patients. So I would, I, would, I would tend to agree with you that there is no free lunch. We may be trading off one set of problems that we had with radiofrequency energy to a different set of problems. Maybe this new set of problems are not as dramatic and draconian in, its, in their um, morbidity and mortality, but yet there may be a significant impact on the overall atrial function, and we really need to understand more about this. And I think this is where regulatory guidelines in really understanding these type of side effects, these type of collateral effects in a more comprehensive fashion for the next generation of catheters or even for the existing catheters need to be better studied as part of the ongoing investigative process. You know, I, I, th I think you hit on it perfectly. You know, um, I think that we, what we have to understand is we trade, you know, the, clin the clinical trials revealed in a, in a very controlled setting that PFA can be very safe, okay? Now we take it into the real world, okay? we have our own kind of creativity or we have our own difficult substrates. There is a ceiling, I think, for to say, hey, above which collateral damage starts to go up. Um, I think it's also because of some of those collateral risks, this should inform, uh, you know, policy, or, you know, official statements on, you know, uh, limitations, but it also should inform, we're in the, we're in the first generation, right? We need, the second generation is coming. And, and now we have these new set of challenges that we need to mitigate through that. And I think EPs need to be vocal and involved in this process for projecting forward the future generation of how we apply PFA uh, through novel technologies. I totally agree with you. I think our excitement for this um, amazing new frontier uh, should come with a word of caution and due diligence and awareness of the potential pitfalls as we lead our incredible field into the next era. Yeah. Well, well thank you, DJ. Thank A beautiful you. study. Beautiful it's been, study. It's been my pleasure. Thank yeah. you. And thank you all for tuning in to Heart Rhythm TV.